All praise is indeed due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his household, his companions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them, to bless every one of us. May Allah accept our supplications and make it easy for all those who are struggling across the globe. Ameen, Ya Rabbal Alameen. My beloved brothers and sisters, Islam is based upon five pillars. We know that. Shahadati Allah ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan rasulullah. The first pillar is the bearing of witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah and that Muhammad peace be upon him is his messenger. Uh, the second being iqam is salah, which is the five daily prayers. Then ita is zakah, which is giving a certain amount of your belongings to the poor. Wasawmi uh, Ramadan and then the fasting of the month of Ramadan. Wahaj al-bayt liman istata'a ilayhi sabila and then the Hajj or the pilgrimage to the house, the sacred house, which means the Kaaba in Mecca, for those who are able and capable. Now, if you look at these pillars, Allah Almighty has ordained them and made them part and parcel of this submission unto Him. Now, Allah having created us, the Creator knows best what exactly we need in order for us to lead a beautiful life in this world filled with contentment and a beautiful life in the hereafter filled with success. So Allah Almighty then tells us to have strong faith in Him and to follow the messengers who were sent in the case of the final Ummah, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the final nation, the final prophet of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So my brothers and sisters, Allah knows that this is good for us. When you have faith, it heals you. When you have conviction, it protects you from anxiety and from so much more. You leave things in the hands of Allah. You enjoy the faith in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And the same applies if you were to follow and emulate the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, you would lead a life filled with goodness. Because when struggles come in your direction, you take it in your stride, you thank Allah, you get closer to your maker, you're still smiling. And when goodness comes in your direction, you're still happy, but it doesn't divert you to bad qualities such as haughtiness and arrogance and you know becoming pompous and so on. The faith will ground you and it will ensure that you appreciate the favors of Allah upon you. So my brothers and sisters, thereafter we have the prayer. No matter what you do, you have to wash yourself and find yourself at certain specified times, facing a certain direction, cutting off from everything and plugging in with your maker five times a day, communicating with him uh, in a unique way that is taught by him. So you would be praying, you would be reciting the Quran, you would be bowing down, you would be prostrating, you would be then sitting, you know, sitting down on the floor and so on. All this is part of the gift of Allah <coughs> subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, if you then take a look at the next pillar of Islam, ita is zakah, to give to the poor. Allah is the provider. Allah, if he wanted, he would have made everyone wealthy and there would not be a need for people to reach out to others because Allah is independent anyway. He can give everyone as much as he wants and he could have filled the needs of every single person. There wouldn't have been a poor person on earth. But part of the test of us being on earth is to be able to be compassionate towards one another, to be able to have a feeling that we need to do something because our brothers, our sisters, other human beings are struggling. Subhanallah. And then it extends further uh, in, on, on a voluntary basis to be able to reach out to other creatures of Allah. That may be voluntary, but it's highly recommended and very rewarding. But we're talking here of the pillar, the pillar being reaching out to others, primarily Muslim and then non-Muslim as well. So this is the compulsory uh, amount that you have to give towards the poor, those who don't have. Now, when you do that, Allah knows what that does for you. It will heal you. It will give you a sense of reassurance and comfort. It will bring you closer to your maker. It will make easy for you a lot that you might be going through. And subhanallah, uh, it will help you in that you would be able to earn more and there would be meaning and purpose to it. What are you going to do with all your wealth? You're just going to amass it and then what? At the end of the day, you've got to go back to Allah 
you know, you've, you're going to have to leave this world and you're going to have to leave everything behind. Rather use things, spend things in a good way so that when you get to the other side, after you depart from this earth, you would not regret the way you spent what you had. Now, my beloved brothers and sisters, thereafter we have Ramadan. Now, we're speaking about a remarkable Ramadan. That's the theme of the conference, subhanAllah. And here we want to talk about the importance of this month. Allah chose it, number one, to be at a certain time of the year. It's the ninth month of the Islamic calendar because it's not a mistake, nor is it a coincidence. It is divinely planned. The Almighty has planned it to be a specified month. And the only answers we would have are from revelation. So let's take a look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah. يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون أياما معدودات. Allah says, O oh you who believe, fasting has been prescribed upon you. It has been made compulsory upon you, just like it was prescribed upon those before you, in order that you may achieve taqwa. And taqwa is a whole encyclopedia full of meaning. Uh, it would mean to create a barrier between you and the disobedience of Allah. Uh, some would say the consciousness of Allah, the fear of Allah. Uh, I'd like to say to develop the correct relationship with Allah. All of that is part and parcel of taqwa. And taj'ala baynaka wa bayna adhabillahi wiqaya bimtithali awamirihi wa jitinabi nawahihi to create a barrier between you and the wrath of Allah, the anger of Allah. And this anger is born out of love because we love Allah so much, we would not like to anger him in any way. We would not like to earn his anger. So how can we actually protect ourselves from the anger of Allah? By fulfilling the instructions that he has laid down and abstaining from the prohibitions that he has dictated. So my brothers and sisters, Allah says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ In order for you to achieve taqwa. Then he says, أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودَاتِ They are a specified number of days. And subhanAllah, Allah says that month, he calls it in the next verse, شَهْرُ Ramadan, The month of Ramadan. And he also says it is the month within which the Quran was revealed that we will get to. But primarily, when we look at the exact timing, the ninth month, you know, you start Muharram, you have Safar, these are the months of the Islamic calendar. And obviously, Umar ibn Khattab anhu was the one who set down that Hijri calendar. But Islamic calendar was always a lunar calendar. SubhanAllah, it was always a lunar calendar. And Ramadan uh, is one of the months, the ninth month. Immediately after that, there are what is called the Ashhurul Hurum, which means the months within which war or to commence any war or hostilities is totally prohibited. So what are those months? Those months are after the month of Ramadan. Dhul Hijjah, Dhul Qi'dah, Muharram and Rajab, if I'm not mistaken. So my brothers and sisters, Allah knows that at this particular time, of the year, it would be the best for us to fast the entire month. If Allah wanted, he could have said to us, fast two days at a time, or maybe fast in a way that you're allowed to have something like water or something like maybe a specified food, maybe dates or something. But no, Allah says no food, no drink from dawn to dusk. That's the choice and decision of Allah. There has to be health benefits for this. It's impossible that Allah dictates something and it is not absolutely beneficial. So whether medicine acknowledges it or not is besides the point. Medicine may come to acknowledge something that Allah has revealed a thousand years later. For you and I, we are believers. We know that it's going to help us in every single way. Ways that science has discovered and ways that have not yet been discovered. So for anyone to tell us that it is harmful, it is bad, as believers, we would discount their statement and we would actually move on and continue with what we are saying and doing. You know, in medicine, they change their minds every time a study is released. They yeah. won't be able to make their minds up. Today, it may seem like they've concretely made their minds up and tomorrow they will change the mind. So the only thing that doesn't change completely is revelation. And Allah says, there will come a time when everything will become in sync with revelation. People will realize, whoa, what is revealed is actually amazing. Take a look at the intermittent fasting being taught by non-Muslims in sync with the Monday and Thursday fast, which was always taught by Muhammad Take a look at the uh, 
the fasting that is being promoted by people who are not even Muslim to say when you abstain and you stay awake during that time uh, while you're abstaining from food and drink, you actually energize yourself. It releases the toxins. It has so much of benefit. Now, I want to ask a question. Imagine if Ramadan was more than a month, how do you think we would fare? Don't you agree as a Muslim that the month is exactly correct in terms of duration for us to fast? If it was just a week or two, it wouldn't have that impact, that effect, it would just be the beginning of something and then it's ended. And if it was more than a month, it would prolong a little bit too much for our excitement to be maintained. And how we have the last 10 nights and the speech of uh, the, the power, uh, the, the night of decree, you know, uh, the, the sacredness of those nights and how we should be livening them up with all acts of worship. So this is something unique because the way Allah has designed the month of Ramadan, it kicks off with a big bang, mashallah. Everyone's at Taraweeh, everyone's excited about the moon, mashallah. And we're there, Allahu Akbar, as soon as the moon is sighted, and that evening already we're in full mode of Ramadan. We can feel the, the spirituality of it. And before we know it, we're up for suhoor, for the first suhoor, which is the pre-dawn meal. And we're enjoying it and we're excited and the month begins. And you know, full swing from first night. And then subhanAllah, people might just calm down a little bit and they might lose a little bit of momentum after perhaps the 10th night. And, and so what happens? You then get to the middle of Ramadan and everyone will start saying, Ramadan is already halfway down. Ramadan is already almost over. Let's make the most of it. And before you know it, you're in the last 10. The last 10 have been given greater value than all of the others, although every night is valuable. You know, if you want to know about the mercy of Allah, the forgiveness of Allah, and the freedom from hellfire. The, that happens every single night from all the nights of Ramadan, not necessarily the first 10, the second 10, the last 10. No, every night is a night of mercy. Every night is a night of forgiveness. Every night is a night of freedom from hellfire. So that is the correct way of looking at things. And towards the end, the reason why we say it is much more powerful is because of the narrations that speak about uh, searching for the month, uh, sorry, for the night of decree, the night of elevation, the night of power, subhanallah. It's really an amazing night. So as you enter the last 10, Allah could have said, no, you know, it's in the first 10. What would have happened to the momentum if Laylatul Qadr was in the first 10 nights of Ramadan? Look at the design of Allah Almighty. He kept it towards the end because the excitement is greater towards the end. On one hand, you're looking forward to Eid because you deserve a day of celebration for having done so much for the sake of Allah. Something halal, permissible on other days. In, in Ramadan, during the fast, I can't have it. At night, I may. But during the daytime, I can't. So how Allah says at night, you can do this. You can be intimate with your spouses as well. You can eat and drink. You can whatever else has to be done, but don't disobey the Almighty. So disobedience in the month of Ramadan is something that may Allah forgive all of us. We're human and we may falter knowingly or unknowingly. But when a person knowingly disobeys Allah in the month of Ramadan, it becomes very tricky because that is the month of earning forgiveness, not earning the sin. May Allah forgive all of us. Like I say, sometimes shortcomings we don't even know about. You know, we have said something or did something that is unacceptable and we didn't realize it. May Allah forgive us. So it is a month where we're supposed to be conscious of all of this designed by Allah. Number one, the timing through the year, which is the ninth month designed by Allah. He wants to keep the momentum going and he wants to keep you looking forward to Ramadan. You know, you have the pre Ramadan months, the, the Shaban, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, used to fast more in Shaban in the run up to Ramadan. And then when Ramadan is over, the, the anticlimax should not set in. So we are taught, Man sama Ramadan thumma atba'ahu sitta min shawal kana ka siyam dahr. Whoever fasts Ramadan and follows it up with another six fasts, inshallah, they will have a reward of having fasted the entire year. So that keeps the momentum up. And then the Mondays and the Thursdays, and then the three days of every lunar month, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. When the moon is, mashallah, full moon almost, you should be fasting during those days because that was taught by Allah. When Allah teaches you something, it can be never be wrong. In fact, it would be maximum benefit from all angles without a single angle being negative. So remember this. Now, Allah has designed it. This is the importance. Ramadan is a pillar of Islam. If we deny it, we cannot call ourselves Muslims completely. And at the same time, if we don't want to fast it, similarly, we are tempering with our Islam. It's a pillar that holds up your faith. You don't want to pray? 
How can you be called a Muslim? You don't want to fast? How can you be called a Muslim? You don't want to go for Hajj? How can you be called a Muslim? You don't want to give charity to the poor? How can you be called a Muslim? That's very strong because today there are people who don't want to go for Hajj. They have the money, they have everything, but something in their mind just tells them, no, you'll get sick if you go there. It's going to be very busy. You're going to inconvenience yourself. Inconvenience yourself, my brothers and sisters, don't look at it that way. Allah wants you there, even if you had to die when you're there. What a blessed death, subhanAllah. You have to die at some point. Allah says, no matter where you are, death will overtake you, even if you're in well-built towers, subhanAllah. So my brothers and sisters, here is this month. We must make an effort to fast it unless we have a valid excuse where we, it would be allowed for us not to fast. Allah says, Whoever is not well or is on a journey, they may make up the missed fasts on other days. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us when he speaks of Shahr Ramadan. Now, if you look again at that, it is such a great gift of Allah. So much of mercy. Allah is telling you, you have to fast. You must acknowledge it's a pillar. You must acknowledge it's a whole month. You must acknowledge that it's the ninth month. You must acknowledge it's the month of Ramadan. And you must acknowledge it's from dawn to dusk. And you must fast. And if you cannot because of your journey or because you have a valid excuse, the women in their menses, perhaps the women with afterbirth, perhaps those who might be breastfeeding or who may be pregnant, who cannot manage to fast, they have an excuse. Subhanallah. Those who are on journey, those who are unwell, uh, uh, those who are elderly, perhaps they are unable to fast due to some reason. Again, it would uh, boil down to the sickness. So in that case, you either make it up on other days or if you really cannot even make it up because you can't fast due to a sickness or some form of inability that you have. In that case, you can give out what is known as a fidya. It's a compensation, a token amount for every single fast. Remember, Remember the fidya is not equivalent to the fast, but it's a token amount of compensation because you couldn't fast. That still does not mean that you must not participate in other acts of worship in the month of Ramadan. You must read your Quran and you must do your dhikr and you must do your other ibadah. You must do your salah. You must do whatever else you can. It doesn't mean just because you were ill or unwell that you are excused from everything. You can just sleep from dawn to dusk. May Allah forgive us. So my brothers and sisters, imagine this part of this talk, the remarkable Ramadan. We're talking of the importance of Ramadan. I've spoken to you about the importance of believing in it, of making sure you, you, you believe in every aspect of it and you fast. And you also believe that Allah's divine plan has placed the month in the most appropriate place ever. And we believe that whatever Allah has instructed us is filled with absolute goodness, not a single negativity in it. And this is also what we were taught by Rasulullah When your maker tells you do this, please do it with open arms, with a beautiful heart. Please do it because your maker knows best what is best for you. And then again, if you're unable because of uh, sickness and valid excuses, you're okay. That's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, fasting in the month of Ramadan, you fasted the month from dawn to dusk, from the Adhan of Fajr right up to the Adhan of Maghrib. And that's if the, that Adhan is said on time. Those who don't say the Adhan on time, some people have a habit of delaying the Adhan of Fajr by five minutes or 10 minutes. That's not permissible. When Allah says, stop eating, you stop at that moment. When Allah says, start eating, you start at that moment. So there is no leeway. People say, I just gave it a leeway of 10 minutes or five minutes. There's no leeway in Islam. Allah knows what it is. So try and do it to the best of your ability. And subhanAllah, uh, Allah will accept it when you have adopted his instruction exactly as he instructed. If he wanted, he would have told us, Leave a leeway just in case you make a little error this way, that way. He would have told us that, but never did he say that. The Prophet Muhammad pressed the importance of uh, delaying your pre-dawn meal, which is the suhoor or the sihri. And he also expressed the importance of hastening the opening of the fast once the time is up. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from us because the idea is you should stop eating when Allah says stop and you start eating when Allah says eat. Amazing. 
that is the obedience of Allah. Then this month is also the month of forgiveness. You must achieve forgiveness. It is one of the important factors of Ramadan. Man sama Ramadana imanan wa ihtisaban ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhanbihi wa man qama Ramadana imanan wa ihtisaban ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhanbihi. Whoever stands in the month of Ramadan in salah, in prayer, with full conviction in Allah, expecting a reward from Allah, and whoever fasts in the month of Ramadan with full conviction in Allah, expecting a reward from Allah, Allah will forgive and wipe out all their previous sins. How many times does Allah have mercy on us by telling us that He is going to forgive all our previous sins? That is amazing. When we get to Allah, we have no excuse not to be totally forgiven. You are human. You may have committed major sin, minor sin. Both those sins, Allah wipes them out. Major sin requires specified tawbah or repentance. And the minor sins, just by doing more good deeds, Allah says, Inna al-hasanati, sayyat, your good deeds will wipe out your bad deeds. So keep on doing good deeds and keep on going. When you stand in Ramadan at night, stand, don't worry. Even if your legs are a bit sore, even if shaitan tries in advance to make us lazy people, we become lazy. You know, one of the important factors of Ramadan is that shaitan is tied up. Now, there is a difference of opinion as to what exactly that means. So some of the scholars say, well, the, the, the maradat shayateen, you know, the chiefs are tied up, but the little ones are still all around. And some of them say, no, all the shayateen are tied up and we are actually, you know, the shaitan within us. We, as because Allah says shayateen al-ins wal jinn. There are two types of uh, shaitan. One is that in humankind and one is in jinn kind. So jinn kind, perhaps if they're tied, then the mankind ones are still there. I mean, there can be a person who's devilish because their nafs has taken over and the nafs has become so prone to sin and so on that it doesn't even think about obeying Allah. So the person becomes a type of a shaitan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And so, uh, when we when we are fulfilling salah, like I was saying, don't be lazy and do it for the, you know, worship of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ feet and legs used to swell and his wife Aisha radiallahu anha used to ask him or asked him a question once at least by saying, Oh messenger, you know your status and you, you're standing in your in prayer and your feet are swelling and so on. He says, Afala akuna abdan shakura. Should I not be a slave who's thankful to Allah? Look what he's given me. He's given me so much, subhanAllah. I want to do something. I want to stand in worship to worship my creator. Brothers and sisters, if you're a true believer, you would want to worship your maker and you would want to earn his happiness. And, and that is something that we just, we believe in. That I want to worship Allah. I want to praise him. I want to thank him. I want to obey him. That's Allah, Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. So don't be lazy when you're standing in prayer. It will achieve for you total forgiveness. When we're fasting, don't complain about the fast to say, ah, it's a tough fast. I'm really, really hungry today. It's been a tough day. Oh, I'm wishing for pizzas and I'm wishing for bread and yeah, burgers and biryani and all of that. No, my brothers and sisters, let's make sure we understand and realize that we shouldn't complain. Do so, meaning keep that fast with a beautiful mind and heart, lovely intention. And it's, it's, it's an honor to abstain from food and drink for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And obviously not just food and drink, but there are two three other things that you need to know uh, sexual relations with your spouse also not allowed from dawn to dusk in the night it's permissible in fact Allah speaks about it uh, that it's it's definitely permissible after the sun sets and then what's also prohibited throughout the fast is using bad words saying abusive things uh, you know lying deception falsehood and so on now that is prohibited even outside ramadan but allah says the reward of your fast would be nullified and you'd be wasting your time if you were not conscious of those things like if i fast during the day ramadan but i don't pray what's the point what did you do i mean you're fasting but you're not praying i mean come on you should fast and pray because fasting is supposed to make you disciplined with your prayer the same applies if you're fasting, but you're swearing and cheating and screaming and yelling and causing problems and calling people names and threatening people and cursing them. What Ramadan are you engaged in here, my brother, my sister? I mean, what's the point of staying away from food and drink? It's not just uh, some exercise where you're going to lose weight. That's not it. The intention is never to lose weight. That's just a byproduct for some people. I mean, some people lose weight in Ramadan. Your intention is never allowed to be, I'm fasting in order to lose weight because then your, your, your intention is wrong. You have to fast for the sake of Allah, but you will lose weight as a result, perhaps, which is a bonus. But some people don't lose weight. They gain weight in Ramadan because they lose the plot. They think that, okay, I stayed away from food and drink for 12 hours, 15 hours, whatever it may have been. And then at night I need to compensate 
for all the food that's lost as though you're doing qada salah they do qada meals so they have the breakfast lunch and supper all at night and they have huge bellies and begin to fall off to sleep at night with a huge tray of rice and whatever else it may have been no that's not the idea that's definitely not the idea remember to be moderate when you eat and remember not to overeat and remember to think about the poor and reach out to them these are all the gifts of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so my brothers and sisters we need to realize that allah has designed this in an amazing way amazing way while we are fasting there are so many other aspects of our lives that are being purified allah says khud min amwalihim sadaqatan tutahhiruhum wa tuzakkihim biha take from their wealth a, a, a charity referring to the zakah that will cleanse them in two ways you know to zakkihim at tazkiyah is the internal cleansing it will cleanse their ways their habits their nature and and their relationship with allah to zakkihim biha yani khud min amwalihim sadaqatan tutahhiruhum wa tuzakkihim biha Tutahiruhum uh, al-tahara is in every way. It cleanses you in every way. And at-tazkiyah also refers to growth. Allah will grant you growth. Growth in what way? Growth number one in your wealth. Because every time you give, Allah says, Whatever you have given in the cause of Allah, you will find it with Allah in a much bigger way, a huge way, double, triple. Allah speaks of You know, the example of the one who has spent a little in a, a charity in the cause of Allah is like that of a person who sowed a seed and it grew seven corns and on each one of the corns there were so many many uh, little seedlings as well subhanallah you know when you see the wheat and how it grows so the the ears of corn may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and may he give us from his mercy so when we give in the month of ramadan it's the compassion it's part and parcel of the good that comes with the fast and that's the reason why your ramadan will not be accepted unless and until you give out a sadaqatul fitr which is the charity to come out of Ramadan in order to exit the month of Ramadan, you pay a charity. Did you know that? And you've got to pay it before Salat al Eid, and you've got to pay it in grain, you've got to pay it in, in, in some form of foods, food items, either dates or rice or grain, something of that nature, a certain amount. Look for the poor. Why? So that they can have a blessed Eid as well. That's one of the reasons why it is said that you should never, it's wrong to delay your Sadaqat al Fitr to after the Eid. It should happen before the Eid. So between the night of Eid and the day before you go for the prayer, you should have given it to the poor and you give it in grain, give it in the food items, which is preferable. And some of the scholars say, well, you can give it in, in monetary as well. But th that's a difference of opinion amongst the jurists, which is fine. The point is, you've got to give the charity. You've got to give something because I've been staying away from food and drink and I've been beautifying myself, purifying myself for the sake of Allah. Here I am exiting from such a beautiful month. I'm going to enjoy myself on this day of Eid. It's a day of feasting. It's prohibited to fast. And what am I doing? I'm giving a charity to those who have less. It's called Zakatul Fitr or Sadaqatul Fitr. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and make us understand how remarkable Ramadan is in all honesty. There's so much more to Ramadan. Let's take a look at the aspect of the Quran. Like I said earlier, Allah says it beautifully. Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila feehi al-Qur'an hudan linnasi wa bayyinatim min al-huda wal-furqan. Allah says the month of Ramadan is the month within which the Quran was revealed. You and I know that the Quran took 23 years to reveal, meaning it came down in 23 years. So why does Allah say it came down in the month of Ramadan? There are so many explanations for that. Number one, it started in Ramadan. Number two, it may have ended in Ramadan according to some of the narrations. And you know what's more important for us to know? It was revealed from the preserved tablet to the lowest heaven in the month of Ramadan. And then it came as and when the occurrences happened. And then uh, it was gathered together every year. Jibreel alayhi salam used to come to the Prophet ﷺ to consolidate the verses that were already revealed. And they consolidated it every year. In the last year when the Quran was completed, Jibreel alayhi salam came and revised everything twice with the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. And this is why it is reported that the Prophet Muhammad we know he was the most generous of all people he would give away things he would look after people he was compassionate he always cared for the orphans the widows the underprivileged and so many more and he was the most generous more than he was normally 
in the month of Ramadan when Jibreel alayhi salam used to come to him and he they used to go through the Quran you know the consolidation of the order consolidation of all the verses that are revealed and so on uh, remember the, the Quran was revealed into the heart of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala qalbika nazala bihi ar-ruh al-amin ala qalbika litakuna min al-mundhirin you know Allah sent Jibril alayhi salam revealed should soften you and you should become generous as a result of your recitation of the Quran Recitation alone is not the only duty that you have towards the Quran. Rather, you have a duty of trying to understand it and putting it into practice and conveying it to others, teaching them how to read it, teaching them about its understanding and conveying to them the message of the Quran, helping them to adopt it in their lives. And we should too adopt it in our own lives. So these are some of the duties that we have towards the Quran. Now, why do I say it should make you generous? Well, I'm getting it from the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ used to meet Jibreel alayhi salam in the month of Ramadan and read the Quran and he was more generous at that particular time. So what I learned from this is in the month of Ramadan, when I read Revelation, I should become more generous. It should make me more generous and I should revise the Quran as best as I can go through its verses. <clears throat> so my brothers and sisters, you look at this month of Ramadan from, from all angles and you will find something amazing. <clears throat> it makes you better with your prayer. It makes you better with your charity. It makes all the pillars of Islam are in Ramadan besides the Hajj, which starts exactly after Ramadan. The minute the moon of Ramadan uh, of Eid has been sighted, the months of Hajj begin. Uh, what are the months of Hajj? Shawwal, Dhul Qida, Dhul Hijjah. Those are the months of Hajj. They started as soon as Ramadan ended. So Ramadan has the power of all four pillars in it, which means I'm going to be praying my shahadati Allah ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah is supposed to be solid and intact. I'm going to be praying, I'm going to be giving charity and I'm fasting. So try to consolidate it. It's a beautiful month. It's not compulsory to give your charity in Ramadan, but the scholars have recommended it because they say good deeds are multiplied in reward in the month of Ramadan without a doubt. And as for prayer, five times a prayer, you are going to pray anyway. So now that you have a Ramadan is a specified time. I'm going to bring in Ramadan, the, the fasting of it, which is a pillar that cannot happen outside that time. But the other ones can happen outside their times besides Hajj. So let's leave the Hajj for now. It starts straight after Ramadan. But the others, I bring them in right now. I've got four pillars of Islam I'm fulfilling at one time. Imagine the power of that. Imagine the, the happiness of Allah there. And this is why the, the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ speaks about how Allah boasts and to his angels about the person who's been fasting and says, what do you think the reward of the one who's fasting is? And then he, he says, Ushidukum anni ghafartu lahum. I want you, O my angels, to bear witness that I've forgiven them. I've forgiven them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us our shortcomings. Wallahi, we are sinners. We're sinful people. Sinful people in the sense that we sin knowingly and unknowingly. Minor sin and major sin. We are humans. What, what gives me a lot of comfort is looking at the story of Ibrahim alayhi uh, salam. Sorry, Adam alayhi salam. Adam alayhi salam, he was told not to do one thing and that's the exact thing he did. When I read about that and ponder over it, I just think of the mercy of Allah. Allah told us specifically not to do certain things. We end up doing these things. Allah says, don't worry, don't worry. Seek forgiveness and don't do it again. And if you fall in it again, seek the same forgiveness and promise not to do it again. Allah says, I will continue to forgive you because you've recognized you have a Lord who can punish you or have mercy on you. I'm going to have mercy on you. La ilaha illallah. Well, this is a beautiful month. I've spoken of some of its importance. Can you see how it is a pillar of Islam? It has in it value. It has in it greatness. It was the month where the Quran was revealed from the preserved tablet or Allah al-Mahfuz to the lowest heavens. And my brothers and sisters, we would be losers if we let the month of Ramadan pass by without earning forgiveness. You have your needs, supplicate every night, call out to Allah every day. And you know, the time of suhoor is also the time of tahajjud. Offer some units of prayer for tahajjud and ask Allah's help, ask his guidance. Keep crying to Allah for your needs every single day. Allah loves it when you become a nag. Human beings don't like it. When you nag someone, please do this, please do this, please do this. People will say, keep quiet. I heard you once. It's okay. With Allah, it's the other way around. He loves the ilhah. He loves it when you actually uh, repeatedly ask him. He loves it. So just keep on asking him the same thing over and over and over again. He hears you the first time and always, but it's your elevation of status and your acknowledgement of the greatness of Allah that is of essence. So my brothers and sisters, 
Make the most of this month. Don't waste your time watching movies and spending the nights going to the malls and, you know, the time uh, sitting and chatting with food and different places. Spend some time in Ibadah, especially now, the last 10 nights. Amazing. We must make greater use of these nights. And this is when we would be able to achieve the greatness of that month. Uh, sorry, that day. Allah says, Laylatul Qadri Khairum Min Al Fishar. The importance of the night of decree, the night of Qadr. So Allah says that is a night that is better than a thousand months, more than 84 years of worship. Imagine if you were to use the entire 10 nights in worship, at least you'd gain it once in your life. And this is why i'tikaf or to actually uh, remain in the masjid during the last 10 nights is a sunnah of the Prophet and he's recommended it. It's good for us to to attempt to do that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. I thank you all for listening and I pray that Allah forgive us And I hope that this Ramadan will be absolutely remarkable and that this talk regarding the importance of Ramadan actually uh, is understood by one and all and that it impacts upon myself and yourselves. Jazakumullah khair.